Hi, I'm Ilyas Mahanna. I'm an assistant professor at Brown University, and I'm guest hosting worldwise on bloggingheads.tv. And I'm going to be speaking today with my friend Kamil Otraji, who will introduce himself now. Hi, I'm Kamil Otraji, a Canadian from Syrian origin, creator of uh, MediusImage.com and uh, CreativeSyria.com. I currently blog uh, at the Syria page on uh, CreativeSyria.com. Hi, Kamil, how are you? I'm fine. Uh, we're speaking, uh, this is a very low tech version. We tried to do the cell phone option and it, it didn't work. So we're going to, uh, we're, we're going for the retro look. Um, so today we're going to be speaking about Syria. And uh, we had, this is actually part two in an installment. Um, we we did a, recorded a segment for Blocking Heads about a year and a half ago on Syria, uh, just as the conflict was getting started. And now it's much hotter. Um, Tens of thousands of people killed, and um, I wanted to just begin actually with uh, with that issue. Some people are calling this a civil war. Um, what's what's your take on that, Camille? Um, it's a limited civil war in in Homs, for example, Syria's third largest city. It was a civil war, if uh, if you want. Um, still, the largest cities in Syria, uh, Damascus and Aleppo, uh, at least the center of these cities, um, have been spared from uh, the uh, full civil war that has been going on in smaller uh, in some of the smaller cities. But the uh, surrounding neighborhoods, usually poorer ones and often uh, more uh, religiously conservative, have uh, been. Uh, uh, experiencing uh, violence that I would uh, describe as almost a civil war. So in 10% of Syria, I would say it's a civil war, but uh, most of the population hasn't yet experienced uh, that kind of violence, but it's quite possible. It's a possibility. So the rest of Syria, um, because on the news it makes it seem like the whole country is engulfed by this conflict. Uh, and then you hear people who are, uh, particularly people who are generally tend to be pro-government, uh, say that no, it's a, so only a few troubled spots that are really getting it, and it's uh, disconnected from uh, from the main population centers, and that the people who are perpetrating the violence actually don't represent a large uh, uh, segment of the population, and that most people just want this all to go away. What's your take of, um, you know? Uh, well, both sides, uh, they have the uh, their extremists and those who are uh, very vocal in, in representing uh, the, their, their respective sides. Uh, the pro-government uh, extremists will tell you that this whole thing is a foreign uh, conspiracy and that most of the Syrian population does not want the revolution. The revolutionary side, uh, they tell you that uh, the Syrian people, they generalize also as if the whole Syrian people want this revolution to take place, and that this is not a foreign conspiracy, it's all homegrown, it's all for democracy and freedom. So both of them are propagandists. Uh, the truth is somewhere in between the two. Uh, um, a large percentage of Syrian people are not happy with the government, with the leadership. They want it replaced. Uh, some of them want, it, want that replaced placement to be uh, violent, uh, they want uh, even revenge, they want punishment to the president, uh, to other figures of the regime or more. Others, they just want uh, progress. Uh, on the other side, you have uh, the mild regime supporters who understand that the regime is making lots of mistakes, but they still trust the regime more than the opposition, or they have other fears. And then you have the extremists who would like uh, the opposition to be crushed by the regime and the Syrian army. So you have a whole spectrum. It's very important to understand that uh, the Syrian people, there's no, no such thing as what the West and everybody in the media call the Syrian people. The Syrian people have uh, so many different shades of uh, opinions and aspirations and fears, and we really have to understand them and respect all of them so that we know what we're dealing with. Yeah. Um... What struck me, that, that something very interesting about this conflict, um, is that it's just how divisive, um, just how quickly it, uh, the, the public opinion, it's almost like there's a culture war, mm -hmm. uh, how quickly Syrians um, became so polarized about what was happening in the country. 
I, I know, we know, we have friends in common who, um, had, you know, before the, the, the situation, before the uprising broke out, were, you know, reliably pro-regime or pro-government or believed at least that Bashar al-Assad was, uh, you know, better than most of, uh, most of the other leaders around the region and they, that his foreign policy was in tune with the aspirations of his people. And these same people now are just, they want to see the end of him, they, want, they don't believe that there's any possibility uh, of um, reforming this government, that they have to be brought down, they have to be, they have to go in the way, you know, uh, Qaddafi went or uh, Bin Ali, that it's basically, it has to be a violent overthrow. Uh, and I was quite shocked to see how many Syrians um, had uh, been very public, very vocal about about their feelings. Does that surprise you at all? Uh, it did at the beginning. Then I had to reflect on it, and I think the way I understand, I, the way I understand it is that I realized the people, uh, regardless of what opinion our common friends had uh, that we've been monitoring and observing. Um, the bottom line is that some people are comfortable with shades of gray and others they like to form uh, sharp, uh, clearly defined opinions. The, uh, what you have in the United States, the equivalent would be the moral clarity uh, crowd. Same thing with, in Syria, the moral clarity crowd in the beginning used to be united behind Bashar al-Assad and uh, the regime as being the champions of Arab nationalism and all the causes uh, from Lib Lebanese causes, Palestinian, Syrian, all the Arab causes, Iraq, the foreign occupation of Iraq. Bashar al-Assad was the champion of all those causes. Uh, now they have adopted another more another cause which is closer to home, which is uh, freedom and democracy in Syria, and they are s supportive of the side which is behind freedom and democracy, which is the opposition, if you want, or the people. The same friends we have who supported before the Palestinian cause and the Iraqi cause are now behind the freedom cause. It's just it's a personality trait. They like to. Champion causes, if you want. Uh, so yeah, they would switch to uh, the next favorite cause. But I mean, wouldn't the people um, you had mentioned that the, the, there's a spectrum of opinions, and there's people who support the government who are more extremists? Wouldn't you describe their positions also as being uh, akin to the moral clarity positions? Yes, on both sides. Basically, the ones who are very vocal tend to be of that type. Uh, I still believe that the majority of the Syrian people are the silent ones who who have opinions, uh, but they are not uh, so sure that one side is better than the other. They are able to see both sides, uh, the pros and cons of both sides, so they do not want to fight for either one of them. They don't want to attack either one of them because they don't see how much better it is than the other side. So I find the people in the center to be... Uh, don't forget, Syria is a, is a nation of 24 million people. What we've seen so far, the activists, whether people demonstrating in the streets, whether uh, people fighting each other on both sides, or people on Facebook arguing, they will not add up to more than a million or two million people. Still, the vast majority of Syrians have not spoken or demonstrated or fought on either side. Uh, you've probably seen it in the Lebanese civil war before. Uh, Yes, we see a lot of fighting and it's widespread across the country and a lot of demonstrating and arguing and heated debates in cafes and in the streets. Mm -hmm. But still, the vast majority of the people are quiet, are cautious. They are, care more about their job, the safety about their children, that they can go to school. Yeah, uh, but I mean, even for the, I mean, one could make the argument that the people who have expressed their opinions, uh, you know, one to two million people is a pretty sizable sample mm -hmm. for 24 million, so that they might, you could make the argument that they are representative. And also, the, the reporters who have gotten into Syria, the ones who, that are generally believed to be reliable and who've covered the region for a long time, mm -hmm. um, who've spent, you know, people like uh, uh, Abdul Ahad and Nir Rosen, who were in conflict zones before, and uh, Anthony Shadid. Yeah, Anthony Shadid, I mean, and Nir Rosen just wrote something for the London Review of Books. He, he was in Syria for like six months. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and covering the situation there in a pretty, you know, what people would describe as a balanced way, talking about how the Alawi community, which is a community um, from which the, the ruling uh, family uh, and, uh, you know, the, the elites uh, come from, uh, how they feel about what's going on. And he's also 
tried to show with the Sunni community, which is the demographically majority, uh, you know, which is in the, the demographic majority in Syria, what their position is. Um, it seems as if uh, they're. You know, there's a lot of, of disenchantment with what's happening, and there's a lot people may want to get on with their lives, but uh, at this point, we've reached a point in the conflict where it's not clear that 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 they're, that they're going to be able to get along with their lives without some major, major changes. I think almost everybody agrees that major, major changes are are uh, needed, uh, and since the beginning of the conflict, I think almost everybody agrees that major changes were needed. Now we have major, major changes. Uh, needed that must, yeah. must believe whatever way we define the difference between the two um, now what are the major changes needed and what are the things that we have to protect that's where the disagreement is it's not okay, I, so I think very few very few question, disagree yeah. yeah very few disagree yeah. that we really need to change there's no going back absolutely even the well, there are some regime supporters who want to go back to the way things were, but I think the vast majority, including the majority of regime supporters, uh, understand there's no going back, and more than understand it, they don't desire going back. Okay, yeah. let me just, before we get, this is obviously where we're going here, uh, mm -hmm. is what, what needs to be changed, but let me just quickly say, there was a, a cartoon going on, going around on Facebook uh, a couple weeks ago, and I, you've probably seen it. Um, something about like Iraq before Saddam fell and Iraq after Saddam mm. fell and, and you see Saddam Hussein in a classroom you know full of um, uh, people of the cloth you know religious figures and they're all kind of sitting at attention and he has everybody uh, nobody's you know everybody's well behaved from and various uh, religious and ethnic groups also they have yeah. Kurds uh, that's right yeah. various groups because Iraq like Syria like Lebanon is a country composed of many different religious groups and many different ethnic groups mm. And after, so that's one panel, and then on the next panel, we have uh, Saddam is gone, and then the whole place is completely, uh, you know, there's chaos in the classroom. And the interpretation on Facebook um, has generally been, well, this is very applicable to Syria. I mean, look at Iraq now. After, before, yes, Saddam was a terrible dictator, but... Uh, he's gone now, and look at Iraq now. Iraq is in shambles. Mm -hmm. Its uh, its, complete, its infrastructure is destroyed. There's no sanitation. The sewage system doesn't work. There's no electricity. It's complete chaos, and um, that could happen to Syria. And so, and I think that it doesn't take a, a die-hard, hardcore regime supporter to point to that mm -hmm. and say, um, "Yeah." So Bashar al-Assad, maybe he maybe is a dictator, but uh, we'll take that over what, we, what we're seeing in Iraq today. Uh, and actually, in Syria, it would be much worse because Iraq is a country that's rich with oil. Syria has uh, nothing like that. Mm -hmm. Iraq's budget, annual budget, I think, was $110 billion this year. Syria's budget would be much smaller. So even with that wealth that Iraq has and with the international support, after since 2003 when it was liberated and turned into democracy. This is nine years later and it's still, the government cannot provide proper electricity and sewage service and other services, essential services to their population. Mm -hmm. So in Syria, you would expect much worse uh, situation. Uh, so yes, most people uh, uh, understand that. The thing is, uh, the active ones that, again, you hear on Facebook or the ones who are talking to reporters, because you mentioned before that uh, many reporters went into Syria and spoke to people. Again, I think the character of the silent majority is that they would not even speak to reporters. Most Syrians are still afraid to speak to reporters, foreign reporters, regardless whether they are pro-regime or anti-regime. Uh, the pro-regime are scared to speak uh, because they're scared the Free Syria Army, which is the opposition's armed uh, uh, rebels, uh, they would uh, punish you. They will kill you, they will kill your family if you speak like a uh, shabih, they call it, which is uh, the term they use for anybody who supports the regime. And the pro-opposition are afraid the Mukhabarat, the feared secret service of the regime, will come and arrest them if they speak against the president. So most people would not speak to a reporter. So the sampling that you mentioned, I would still not take it that uh, seriously. Okay. But, uh, All right. Well, but, okay. But so going back to the, going yeah, going back to what we're yeah going back to uh, to the uh, prospect of uh, uh, re re toppling the regime. What will happen to Syria? Um, as you as you recall, last time we spoke uh, from the beginning of the crisis. I I warned that this will happen. I said we will end up with a civil war. We will destroy the country. Uh, and we will risk a, a regional war that could turn into something even bigger, the return of the Cold War. 
uh, because Syria is central to all the problems in the Middle East. There are so many problems in the Middle East, so many conflicts that uh, the United States, the international community, do not have a solution for. The first one is the Arab-Israeli conflict. Uh, you have the uh, Lebanese conflict, whatever it is. Uh, we, we, Lebanon has so many issues inside. Uh, and then you have the Kurdish problem. You have the Sunni-Shia conflict. All these are conflicts that could explode. And Syria is at the center of all of them. You remove Syria from the scene, one or more of these will explode also. And uh, most people at the beginning did not pay attention to it because they were so charmed with what happened in Egypt and uh, Tunisia. People were looking forward to the Tahrir Square moment where they would dance in the streets like the Egyptians did when they deposed Hosni Mubarak. Uh, but, but what's the alternative? I mean, at this point, it's. Um, it's kind of beyond the control of any one power to affect uh, an outcome. Control is a strong word, so yeah, it is. I agree it is beyond the control of any one power, but uh, many powers have considerable influence. And if they agree, the, uh, the sum of their influences will add up to sufficient uh, power. Uh, to, to, to influence the situation in a, in a positive way. Ba basically, the United States and Russia if they agree, okay. or the international community, which is the United States and its allies in NATO, uh, on, on one side, and the BRICS countries, Russia, China, Brazil, and South Africa. Well, okay, yeah. so but before we, before we get to the mechanism of change, if that's even possible, let me just take you back to what you were saying about what kinds of changes are needed. Mm. Okay. Um, maybe if you recall, we spoke about it a few weeks ago. Uh, I think uh, what is needed uh, the change which has the best chance of uh, of uh, being barely accepted by both sides. You're not going to have. Look, we are. We either have one side defeating the other and imposing its own terms to its liking on the other part of Syria, uh, or we can have a compromise that both of them will hate, but they will barely accept because okay. it's not exactly to their liking. Uh, that compromise, uh, if I. Uh, describe it, both sides will say, no, 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 that's not uh, too good, but it's really, I think, the only thing that's in, in, in the middle between the two asp uh, sets of uh, aspirations or fears. Uh, it would be basically to have a transition period of a few years uh, during which uh, the what we call the regime now, uh, the army, the security services, the president, or parts of the regime would remain but uh, the office of the prime minister, which until now has been a joke, basically, uh, would become uh, much more uh, powerful. And we will have elections, parliament, new parliamentary elections, because the current parli parliament nobody is taking seriously also. Uh, we will have new parliamentary elections that are monitored by uh, a balanced uh, set of uh, monitors from the west and the east. Uh, then, depending on the results, the parties that uh, can form a national coalition government, they will be allowed to. Uh, probably the opposition will be able to pick the prime minister. And that would be the person from now on in charge of everything in Syria except defense, national security, and foreign policy. See, the regime's strong points are that it is the most experienced and most successful in uh, in managing the Middle Eastern problems and in uh, protecting Syria's uh, uh, causes and rights internationally and regionally. Plus, it's a protector of secularism in Syria, including women's rights, minority rights, uh, ethnic and religious minorities. So uh, ideally, we'd like a situation where the regime will still be in charge of these, so that regime supporters will not be scared of change and they will not resist it. But we have to take away from the regime everything else. The regime has been very corrupt, just like the rest of Middle Eastern companies, uh, countries. But uh, yeah, people are sick of corruption in Syria. So, uh, and they've been not very good in managing the economy. If you want, they're not. Um, they haven't been considered successful managers of uh, anything. Uh, State-owned enterprises are all failures, and they right. lose money, etc. So you will take all of that uh, education, the economy. Healthcare, everything you'll give it to an, uh, an elected uh, prime minister representing the parties that won a majority in in, in, in parliament in parliamentary in new parliamentary elections. 
that will give uh, the opposition uh, control of uh, everything in Syria except defense, security, and foreign policy. But the, I mean, the opposition will say to that, um, I think that that is not, that's a deal that actually the regime, the current regime would not be that opposed to. I mean, whereas the opposition really feel like they got the short end of the stick because national security, in other words, the intelligence apparatus would still be in the control of the regime itself. And so they would have- It will have to, it, no, no, it will have to be, it, uh, I should have mentioned that too. It will have to be reformed seriously. There will have to be parliamentary, pa parliamentary committee in charge of, uh, uh, monitoring uh, the performance of the security agencies because currently they are uh, uh, feared and uh, not trusted by a large uh, part of the Syrian population. So they will have to change, but they uh, they will not. The same people will run it. Perhaps you would remove uh, some of the uh, outrageous characters from there, but. Uh, it will still be part of the regime, but it will have to now respond and uh, to, to be monitored by the media, by uh, parliament, and everything. So, but how? I mean, how does that work from a like a real politic perspective? Mm -hmm. um, how does a, a civilian parliament a monitor a, a security apparatus that basically doesn't answer to anyone? In effect, I mean, maybe they mm -hmm. answer formally to uh, the civilian government that is elected. But if, if the, the people holding the guns are still the people holding the guns, that's where you will have to have a sort of international and regional guarantees uh, that if the government, uh, which represents uh, the people, if you want, because it's elected, uh, feels that uh, security agencies are not uh, respecting the agreement, they can speak to the Turks, to the Americans, whoever they want to, and uh, the, the the regime will have to understand that um, it's being monitored during the, during this uh, transition period of few years. The regime will have to prove that it is respecting the agreement, and. Uh, Whatever, if we reach that stage, and it's difficult, of course, to go there, but if we do, if we're lucky enough to reach that stage, uh, we have to be realistic in understanding that uh, the regime and the opposition will keep doing things that will disappoint everybody for a while. So it will be a difficult process that we need always other parties to monitor, the Russians and the Americans, um, perhaps the Iranians and, and others, Turks or Saudis also, on the opposition side to sort of guarantee that their friends inside Syria, the regime and the opposition, will uh, will be under control to some extent. So, so, you're, so you are in favor of uh, internationalizing the conflict as a means to solve it? No, no, just uh, monitoring and sort of to provide guarantees that, uh, th that their, if you want, not clients, but their friends inside Syria will will uh, indeed uh, respect to a large extent the uh, the agreement they sign and we really have to understand that nobody will respect it 100% because it never happens uh, anywhere else but uh, hopefully we'll we'll have overall sufficient progress that most people will be happy enough with okay so uh, assessing that scenario against the scenario that no compromise has gone for and actually the the, the conflict continues with both sides trying to eliminate the other which one do you think is more likely uh, I'm sorry, I didn't get the other scenario that you mentioned? I mean, the scenario you mentioned, there's either the scenario that both sides continue to fight and they try to eliminate the other, or we go towards compromise. Which one do you think is more likely? Uh, well, we're starting to, uh, to uh, see some signs that uh, people closer to the center from both sides are discovering the need uh, already uh, already at the point of discovering the need to uh, to uh, to try harder to to reach a compromise uh, the people on the extremes on both sides are still going to fight we're not there yet uh, for the next i expect for the next few months at least uh, we will still see the army fighting the uh, rebels uh, and don't forget there are also foreign fighters now uh, in syria i think it's estimated about 5000 foreign fighters, jihadists, who are inside Syria, they don't care about what's going on in Syria. They just want to fight until the end. Mm -hmm. They want to fight the regime. So we have a problem there too. The problem is there's no there's no way to deal with it except that the army will keep fighting them until they kill them or be killed by them. I don't think there's anyone who can speak for them and reach an agreement with foreign jihadists. So there will be fighting in Syria, even if, uh, even if all the opposition in Syria agree. Don't forget that... Um, 
I think uh, you read also the, argument, the article yesterday in The Guardian. These jihadists are now fighting the Free Syrian Army, which is fighting the Syrian government. To them, both armies, the Syrian army and the opposition, are not uh, moral enough for their uh, purposes. So uh, you're going to have lots of fighting, uh, not only between Syrian army and opposition, between opposition now and jihadists also. Right. Yeah. The opposition is notoriously uh, fractured, and I mean, they say it themselves that there's a million different opposition groups. Mm. Um, some of which met uh, in Damascus on over the weekend. Uh, there was a meeting of the let's see the national coordination bodies, what they're calling mm -hmm. them, um, the NCB, and 20 other opposition parties met in Damascus uh, to create what they're calling a national conference for rescuing Syria. And there were 28 parties that boycotted because of um, what they're claiming is the uh, the NCB's relationship with the Free Syrian Army. Uh, which it refuses to condemn, uh, and so you have these other opposition parties who are who say no. We have to revisit the relationship with the uh, Free Syrian with the Free Syrian Army. Mm -hmm. But so the opposition, in other words, has when you say that the radical elements on both sides are going to keep fighting on the opposition side. Okay, it's clear who are the hardliners and who are the the ones who want to accom reach accommodation on the regime side. We can't talk about elements that are hardliners and others because the regime, in certain ways, is a monolith, isn't it? I mean, it's all it's centralized. No, I think the regime is united in wanting to stay in power and not allow the uh, religious extremists to, to be uh, part of the new Syria. But beyond that, uh, the regime also, like any, like any uh, party, will have many different views inside it. Uh, uh, in the regime, you have, uh, you have uh, I know people who are quite, uh, quite uh, reasonable. And I hear of people who are scary. They're not reasonable at all. Uh, you'll find those, you hear legends about them in uh, intelligence uh, services. Uh, but, okay, but where is, I mean, ultimately, is it not all reporting to the top, or do you think that there's even factionalization within the command structure? Nobody has full control anywhere, including in Syria, especially now after the crisis. What happened is now that within the regime, there's a realization that the main thing that's holding Syria together is the army. So I think now the strongest people in the regime are some generals in the army, because uh, without the Syrian army, Syria would have been now totally into civil war. You would have had hundreds of thousands of casualties, not 20,000. Uh, so uh, they might have the upper hand now. The president, I really don't know how to read him. On the one hand, he disappears for a month, and you hear from people close to him that he sort of wants people to, his supporters to realize he, 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 he might leave eventually. On the other side, you hear that he is still challenging uh, the other, uh, the, the, his opponents. Uh, so I really don't know how to read him, whether he wants to stay or not. Uh, he will make that decision. But the regime will support him until the end, because he is a, a symbol of the regime and of Syria. It's a con he's a continuity symbol. It's scary in the Middle East, many countries like Lebanon, Syria, and Iraq. Uh, the definition of the country is not by clear geography. Like the United States, you have oceans on both sides. But uh, over there, it's uh, symbols, the national anthem, the flag, the president, the army, the external causes, you know, the Arab-Israeli conflict. These are the things that unite Syria. And the uh, opposition has been working hard on dismantling every symbol of the state. So they created another flag. They attacked the president. Uh, they put into doubt uh, all the uh, foreign policy achievement that the Syrians used to be proud of. Now it's all uh, considered uh, uh, a joke. It's all being a, a client of Iran, uh, that all the Syrian foreign policy objectives are in service of Iran and Hezbollah. So they, they, uh, they are destroying the symbols of the state. And the Syrian army, of course, now they call it the Assadist army. The flag, they call it the Ba'athist flag. Right, but yeah. it's clearly because there must be popular sentiment on the street that doesn't that regards those. You, I mean, you say these are symbols of Syria, uh, and that Syrians used to be proud of, but clearly there are Syrians who are not proud of them, and who want who don't believe that this represents them anymore. That regard, you know, the the, the government as uh, completely corrupt and vicious, and the, the, you know, they, maybe these. You see what I'm getting at? This yes. This is yes. not uh, something endemic. This is not something intrinsically Syrian. It's an ideology that was prop propagated by the regime, by the 
by the box. Yeah, and you know where I stand on this, this part, I think, is not natural. I mean, uh, hating corruption of the government is a natural reaction to because there was real corruption. But starting to hate the flag and absolutely insist on a new flag, uh, which is an old flag, uh, this is the same flag that every party that uh, was supported by um, the West, if you want, uh, adopted, like Farid Al Ghadri, if you remember him from 2005, Syrian opposition leader, which was supported by uh, by Dick Cheney and the Bush administration. His his uh, website, I have a screenshot of his website uh, for his party's website in the United States. He had the same flag. Uh, it's um, this is foreign. Uh, it's advisors, uh, you know, uh, public relations advisors for the revolution side who are in the West. They advise them to change the flag at some point. And it's systematic. I see them how they uh, they, they are. Uh, they are attacking every symbol of the state. I mean, the people do not should not have anything against the symbol of the state. They they will have something against against uh, the uh, bad practices of the regime, but not symbols necessarily. But right. and anyways, uh, I don't think these are the main issues. The main issues are, I think, the biggest dividing issue uh, for now is whether or not to allow religion to play the major role in politics like they did in Egypt and Tunisia and Libya, the countries that uh, preceded Syria in the Arab Spring, what is called the Arab Spring. Do you Spring. think there's, okay, so let's, let's look at that. I mean, do you think there is um, popular support for um, a more religious, more uh, conservative um, system? Uh, there is. It's, uh, there is popular support. That's why I think this is one of the major uh, topics that uh, are Think of it like the Jerusalem question between the Arabs and Israelis. Whenever you had the United States mediating between the Palestinians and Israelis, they often were saying, "Okay, let's keep Jerusalem for five years from now. We'll talk about it later." Now we really cannot. It's gonna. It's a deal breaker if we start with Jerusalem. The same thing in Syria. If you want to insist on deciding that uh, uh, that question now, if you, I mean, going for that change because now you, you, the religion is not allowed in Syrian politics. The state is uh, secular. Um, if the revolutionaries insist on that, uh, many people, mo everybody on the regime side will be will rejected. I will reject it. I'm, I'm, I'm a mild regime supporter, if you want, uh, or a status quo supporter, but uh, I'm adamant not to at all accept uh, religious But do you politics. think that the average, the average Syrian, and there's 24 million, do you think the most people would prefer to have a more conservative style system? I think most of them they don't care again, but uh, the, the the those who are very active uh, in, in trying to depose the regime, they maybe a majority of them would. Uh, I think no, not maybe. I'm almost sure a majority of them would like the uh, constitution to be changed in a way that it will allow the Muslim Brotherhood or other religious parties to uh, to uh, compete in Syrian okay. politics. Well, let, let me let's just put some background. Currently, the the the, the new political parties law that was enacted just last year um, allowed for the you know the, the contestation of power by by opposition parties, uh, not just the Ba'ath Party, which had been the only uh, political party for decades, um, but with the proviso that um, parties could not be based on religion or ethnic uh, or ethnicity or a geographic location. Right. Yeah. That they had to have members who came from all sects and, and all the different geographical Areas regions and, and so on. And ethnic backgrounds, etc. Yeah. And uh, this is a problem, obviously, for a party like the Muslim Brotherhood in Syria, uh, which, like the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood, has widespread support. It's been in exile for many years. Um, but so, th I mean, this brings me to a question that I've you know, we've had many conversations about the place of religion and politics. And one thing I hear you and uh, many Syrians say, they kind of look at a, a country like Lebanon and they say, ah, oh, Lebanon, look at look at Lebanon. We don't want to end up like Lebanon. And Iraq. Uh, and Iraq, okay. Uh, Lebanon and Iraq, but especially Lebanon where religion is totally, religion and politics are intertwined and it's, uh, we're not like that. Syria is not like that. We don't want to be like that and we're not like that. But if you look at the case of Lebanon, I think recently there was a uh, situation where there was a very um, there were Sunni protesters who were blocking roads, and there was a, a Salafist movement that emerged in Lebanon that's still there to some extent. Mm. Um, that were they were protesting various issues, and the reaction from the Sunni community in Lebanon was mostly one of um, 
you know, they didn't sympathize with these people at all. Um, and they kind of rejected them in a way. And the mainstream Sunni party tried to distance itself from these Salafist elements. And in, in a way, because religion is kind of out there and in, in, involved in politics in Lebanon, it also tends to kind of defang it um, to the extent that parties go out of their way to, to court uh, members you know, who are not co-religionists um, and some kind of a nationalist um, uh, rhetoric is, is sought for. Whereas in Syria, what you're telling me is that after decades and decades of Baathist, secular, you know, top-down kind of um, propaganda, anti-religious, trying to keep religion out of politics, what I'm hearing from you is that if that is removed, then every, then they're going to, you know, the Muslim Brotherhood is going to rule Syria the way it rules Egypt. Why is that the case? Uh, well, two differences. Syria, if you want to look at the demographics, Syria is between Lebanon and Egypt. Uh, in Egypt, you have 90% Sunni Muslims and 10% uh, Christians, roughly speaking. Uh, in Lebanon, you have a population that is uh, almost equally split between Sunnis, uh, Shias, and uh, Christians of various uh, denominations, plus, uh, mm -hmm. plus the Druze. Uh, so in Lebanon, you can't have 50% uh, majority from any one of them, from the Sunnis or Shias or the Christians, if you have real uh, one man, one vote uh, kind of uh, democratic elections. Uh, in Egypt, you're guaranteed to have uh, what you had, the Muslim Brotherhood in power. And in Syria, uh, it's in between. You have 70% Sunni Muslims and 30% religious minorities, but also you have 10% Kurds who are Sunni Muslim mostly, but they don't vote like Sunni Muslims. They, they are more liberal and uh, they would, very few of them would vote for the, probably none of them will vote for the Muslim Brotherhood. So uh, the Muslim Brotherhood will have uh, up to 60% that could vote for them. Uh, so, and again, many Sunnis are very secular and they definitely hate the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, so they, okay, so, so that, it's somewhere closer yeah. actually to 40 to 50 percent. So it's possible, it's a real possibility that they will win. It's not guaranteed they will win, but it is a real possibility and nobody can take that chance with their life, with their country. It's, it's, uh, it might work in Egypt for a while because most people are Sunni Muslims and uh, at worst they won't, well, they, a man will not be able to drink a beer in public if the Muslim Brotherhood decide to to take certain uh, measures against that. But in Syria, you have uh, some communities that feel the Muslim Brotherhood are their enemies. And they fear they will take revenge against them, namely the Alawites, if you want, and uh, many other uh, secular uh, Syrians or minorities. But, okay, but right, but what I'm, this is what I've always, I mean, I hear conflicting signals. On the one hand, I hear that the Muslim Brotherhood doesn't actually enjoy that much support because, you know, of the Sunnis that are Kurds who don't vote for them, and many Sunnis are liberal, and they support the president, and they, and a lot even of if they, Even if they don't support the president, there are many Sunni liberals in the opposition. Like mm -hmm. many left the, uh, the, uh, the, what's the Paris-based uh, Syrian National Council, because right. they realize it's actually controlled by the Muslim Brotherhood. They are opposed to the president, to the regime, their opposition, but they, they don't like the Brotherhood also. Right, so yeah, this is what I'm saying, is that on the one hand, there is like people who, this, let's say mild regime supporters, as you describe yourself, look at the situation of the Muslim Brotherhood and they say they don't actually enjoy support in Syria because uh, you know, all the, no, no minority member would vote for them and then among the Sunnis who might vote for them, uh, many of them are liberal, some of them support the president, then you have the Kurds, and so they, you know, they're not going to, they're not, what, their message is not appealing to Syrians. But on the other hand, there's, you're saying that um, we can't allow them to run because they will get 60% of the vote possibly, and then they'll make our lives miserable. No, saying? actually, no, okay, okay, I'll try to clarify. I understand what you're saying. Okay, uh, first of all, not allowing religion, religious or ethnic parties or, or regionally based parties uh, is, is to avoid uh, the politics of Lebanon, if you want. Uh, so let me give you an example of what's going on in Lebanon. Forget only the Muslim Brotherhood. Let's widen the, talk, the discussion a bit. In Lebanon, you have, take the average politician. He has loyalty to his prime minister or to the president. You know, the prime minister is Sunni, the president is Christian, and or to the uh, speaker of parliament, uh, Nabih Burri, who is a Shia Muslim. He will have loyalty to his uh, party, 
he will have loyalty to the religious figure that he respects the most, the uh, you know Maronite patriarch per uh, perhaps, or to Hassan Nasrallah from Hezbollah. He has loyalty to an external country that uh, that sponsors the party he comes with or the religion he comes with. So Shiites are usually, uh, you know, in opinion polls, you see Shiites are 95% supportive of the Syrian regime, for example, or, or of Iran, whereas uh, the Sunnis are supportive of Turkey or uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, so once you have religion, it won't be only the Muslim Brotherhood. You're going to have the Syrian Catholic Party and the Syrian uh, Assyrian Party and the Orthodox Party and the Alawite Party. The Alawite Party will be support, will be sponsored by Iran. The Catholic Party will be sponsored by some European country, perhaps, and the Orthodox Party will be sponsored by the Russians. And it will be a mess. So we'll have the same mess that you have in Lebanon, but much bigger, Syria size. And that would be very dangerous to the stability of the Middle East. Imagine the the destabilization that you had in Lebanon, how it spread to, uh, how it uh, it created chaos in the rest of the Middle East. Often, throughout the past few decades, you're going to have much more serious de uh, destabilization effect in Syria if a much larger country like Syria is also like Lebanon suffering from the same thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I don't want to get sucked into a discussion, a discussion about Lebanon, but while we're on the subject of Lebanon. Uh, a few, this gets us back to the issue of who's in control in Syria. A few weeks ago, uh, something happened in Lebanon that is sort of unbelievable. Um, a, uh, a formerly high ranking official, a former minister, Michel Samaha, uh, who is known for his close ties to the Syrian government, was arrested um, on charges that he had been involved in a plot to bring explosives from Syria at the behest of the Syrian intelligence agency, specifically Ali Mamluk, who's a high-ranking intelligence figure, uh, bring explosives from Syria to Lebanon and plant them around the country uh, in a conspiracy to cause you know, explosions and, and pit different communities against each other as a way of creating chaos in Lebanon. This is the kind of thing that um, a does not happen in Lebanon. You don't have high-profile people being arrested by the Lebanese government uh, and then put on trial uh, without somebody making a huge deal. You know that that person's supporter is making a huge deal about it, um, especially if the person is has close ties to Syria. Mm. Uh, and it, it it was shocking that he was arrested, and it was shocking that his allies, especially Hezbollah and um, other people within the government didn't raise a stink about it because apparently the evidence against him was so overwhelming that nobody wanted to touch it. Uh, so let's assume that given this uh, deafening silence from the pro-Syrian people in Lebanon, let's assume that uh, the charge against Samaha uh, is uh, credible. What does that say to, to you about what Syria's, what the government is trying to do in Lebanon vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the stability there and why? Uh, I tried to follow the, the Michel Samaha case. It's quite confusing, as I'm sure it was to you. Um, what you mentioned is all true. Uh, well, not all true. I would remind you that in 2005, uh, when there was an attempt also to weaken the Syrian regime, uh, Syria's friends in Lebanon, four of them were arrested without charges. Uh, the four generals who were arrested by the Meles investigation, and they stayed in prison for years. Then they were released because there were no no evidence against any of them. So yes, they, you could you could arrest a pro-Syria figure in Lebanon when when some Lebanese are uh, helping uh, regional powers and international powers to weaken the Syrian regime. Right, but the, the, there is a crucial difference here. That's what makes it so interesting. Is that in 2005 they were arrested and the international community was really the the, the player that pushed you know especially specifically the United States and France. They were pushing this on the Lebanese, and and the arrest of those generals, and the whole investigation of the Hariri uh, assassination generated enormous controversy in Lebanon, and Syria's friends in, Le in, in Lebanon really resisted every every step of the way. Whereas in this case, Samaha was arrested, and there wasn't a peep out of Hezbollah or Michel Aoun. Uh, you know, yeah, that that part that part I agree with you. I was just I only yeah. disagreed with the part I mentioned. Right. But, so but my point is that you know yes, let's, we can assume that this that uh, that there is there is kind of consensus on the fact that Samaha is, is guilty, or at least there is good reason to believe that there is some kind of a plot from Syria, uh, originating in Syria, whether it's Ali Mamluk or somebody else, there is some kind of effort to destabilize Lebanon. Okay, I, uh, I'll give you my, uh, whatever I heard from talking to friends in Syria and Lebanon about this. 
I think uh, Syria's allies in Lebanon are not confident anymore uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the people who you call the regime in Syria, all of them, because we've had cases where um, you have, uh, on the one hand, uh, officers in the Syrian intelligence and in the army who are actually working for the opposition from inside the regime. They, 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 are, they defected, but they did not leave. They, it's, uh, they want to topple the regime from inside. So you could have one case where somebody who, is, uh, who did this and then uh, tipped off the Lebanese to tell them, look, Samaha will have a, a bomb, and he was stupid enough to accept to carry it. Maybe one of his former friends in the regime, who is now who wants to topple the regime now, wanted to to create this to uh, to uh, to implicate the regime, mm. or uh, that's the main possibility. I think another possibility is that some people in the regime uh, might be now really stressed out and uh, not thinking straight anymore. So I don't I. I really don't think it's the main uh, po uh, regime policy if you want the president to be uh, the main uh, figure in the regime. It's not, uh, it's not uh, their policy to destabilize Lebanon because they have done so many other things to try to, uh, to calm down Lebanon. For example, Hezbollah has never been called on to respond. Remember, they were challenged, some Shiites were killed. Uh, Nasrallah asked, them, asked uh, his supporters to, to get off the streets and to quiet things down. So if they wanted to, uh, to destabilize Lebanon, that would have been a great excuse. They didn't have to put bombs anywhere. So, right. so the main part of the regime definitely does not want to destabilize Lebanon because they have their hands full in Syria. Uh, but uh, yeah, you could have somebody in the regime who is uh, crazy enough to think this is uh, the thing that should be done and he disagrees now with the rest of the regime. Or it could be somebody who defected but he's still inside. He wants to talk with the regime by implicating it. Okay. Uh, what, uh, this is probably Maybe the last question mm -hmm. for me. Um, what do you think uh, the chances are? I mean, we're going into the winter time, uh, and the economic problems that Syria has has endured thus far uh, are going to be um, exacerbated when we have to deal with issues of heating fuel, uh, supplies getting in. You know, when the weather changes, and uh, these very poor areas, and uh, people don't have ways. I mean, we already have internal. Dis internally displaced people over hundreds of thousands. We have hundreds of thousands uh, leaving Syria. Um, it's a humanitarian disaster, and it's only going to get worse when the winter comes. Uh, can what do you think the regime's chances are of holding on and, and without complete collapse? I mean, can they continue to pay salaries to the army? Can they uh, prevent this from sliding into just something beyond their control? The regime. Uh, does not share uh, information about how much money it still has. Uh, when the crisis started, uh, Syria had zero um, uh, national debt, and it had uh, supposedly $18 billion in national reserves. So I assume uh, a large part of that has been spent. But they don't see, I think they still have some money because they don't seem to be um, uh, rushing for uh, to compromise and to uh, to try to reach a solution. The uh, people who have visited uh, high-ranking regime officials in Damascus, they describe them as being relaxed and confident they will win. That it will take time. You know, President Assad has spoken uh, recently uh, publicly twice, and and twice he said it will take time, but we're winning. Uh, we're absolutely sure we are winning. It will take some time, which means they they are not rushing. I heard that Iran uh, lent them a billion dollars recently, so that could uh, sustain them for a while. Syria is an efficient country. A billion dollars will last a long time. It's not like a billion dollars in the United States where it could be spent in a few hours. Uh, the buying power of, the, uh, of everything in Syria is, is um, very different. People are used to live on almost nothing. The state has still, is still paying for uh, free medical care, uh, for education, and all salaries uh, for state employees and for the army. So in that sense, the state is still functional. And most people did not experience it, the civil war kind of uh, um, conflict. But uh, I, my guess is in years, not in months, that in perhaps in a year and a half, two years, two years, three years, where uh, the problems will be much more acute. But don't forget, Iraq lived under sanctions for, I don't know, 15 years, and Saddam Hussein was not toppled. 
So uh, that will not. Yeah, but there wasn't there wasn't this kind of uh, constant military deployment, you know, to to uh, squash uh, opposition. I mean, there's just now it's uh, there's like we're hearing every single day reports of uh, tens of people killed. There's the, the, air, the air force is being deployed to shell Aleppo. Um, there is uh, skirmishes everywhere. The, the military must be pressed very thin. Not very thin, no, because the Syrian military is, uh, for example, Gaddafi's military, uh, his uh, supporters in the military were about 10,000, estimated at 10,000 by French defense minister at the time. The Syrian uh, military, uh, at least the, uh, the uh, loyalists to the regime, are at least 250,000 between military and special forces and intelligence forces, etc. So we're talking about uh, an army that's, I don't know, 20, 30 times larger. Uh, they will uh, they will uh, last much longer. They manufacture their own ammunition and weapons, uh, so uh, I don't think that's an issue. Uh, the army is probably tired, but uh, uh, I don't think we're anywhere near uh, uh, thinking of that as a factor. Uh, however, um, I mean, people are getting tired. The regime supporters' main argument for supporting the regime is that the regime provides us stability. So if uh, that's why the rebels have been trying hard to infiltrate Damascus and Aleppo so that the two main cities that have been feeling very comfortable until now will not be able to sleep at night anymore. They will have to leave the conflict and to start hating the regime the opposition would hate. It might, it might work out, but it hasn't worked until now. Don't forget eunuch Saddam Hussein also. Uh, sanctions led to 300,000 to 500,000 estimated deaths of children, as uh, um, admitted by uh, Madeleine Albright on 60 Minutes. Uh, so up to 500,000 people lost their children because of sanctions, because of Saddam Hussein. So, but they still did not overthrow him. So, right. so we're not anywhere near that in Syria yet. Out of a population of 24 million, 20,000 died. I know it's a lot, 20,000 died, but 24 million is a much larger uh, number. So most Syrians did not really suffer extremely. It's, it's difficult conditions, but it's not the extreme pain and suffering that, for example, in Lebanon, you had a, po a population of 4 million, I think, in the 70s and 80s when you had the civil war, and uh, 200 to 250,000 people died. So, in, in comparison, Syria is nowhere near the Lebanese civil war or the Iraqi uh, kind of uh, casual, number of casualties. Right. Um, I think we're supposed to uh, bring this up, bring this back to the United States. Maybe we'll close with that, actually. Mm -hmm. As far as where do you think uh, the U.S. role, does it have any role to play? And what, what, can, what role can it uh, you know, the U.S. play if it wants to? Do you think it has been playing a role, or do you think it has been sort of uh, you know, Obama uh, trying to um, get involved? Is he, is he taking the back seat here? What's your sense of that? Uh, President Obama has been much wiser than President Bush and his administration. He did not uh, make this an American national pride issue. So he has all the options open. He can back down, he can change. Uh, so he dealt with it in a very smart way in that sense. However, I think the way they allowed the Syrian opposition to to bias their expectations about the probabilities of success, success in the case of the United States is toppling the regime which is uh, allied to Iran. So I think they're mistaken to speak only to Syrian opposition. Uh, ambassador for the uh, American ambassador to, to, to Syria, who was in the United States for the past few months, does not meet with uh, anyone but opposition. and. That's always a mistake. It's, uh, I think the United States uh, needs to reconsider its, uh, its analysis on Syria. It's, it's mistaken, it's heavily biased. And so what do you think, is, uh, if you were advising the, the US uh, uh, president about what uh, why his policy would be, what would that be? Stay at an equal distance from the pro-regime and anti-regime camps and uh, be much more decisive and take a leading role because uh, everybody has been uh, warning the United States that the Syria crisis is really complex and difficult and you will fail, you will get your hands burned if you, if you try to play in there. Uh, it's truly a very complex crisis, but you cannot let it uh, go on like that because the whole Middle East will be drawn in. Uh, a regional war is a real possibility. We already see Turkey starting to be de destabilized with the Kurdish uh, uh, 
uh, issue rising up to the top and even if you listen to discussions in Turkish parliament opposition uh, leaders who are mostly Alevis are now you know uh, arguing with Erdogan uh, on really very nasty sectarian uh, uh, using very nasty sectarian language from both sides and uh, you cannot allow that to, to you can see it starting and it should not be allowed to to go on because the regime will not will most likely not fall anytime soon so everybody's still hoping okay we can still tolerate it the regime will fall soon no it will not i really don't think so uh, just take an equal distance from all parties and be very decisive and talk to the russians and talk to the everybody in syria encourage everybody to engage in national dialogue and uh, help them uh, with your own uh, guarantees as only a superpower can guarantee it Yes, but don't you think that an essential part of let's say let's say the U.S. gets involved in kind of like the plan that you were talking about before, you know, some kind of transitional phase? I mean, do you think that there's any way that the opposition is just not going to buy into any kind of transitional phase that doesn't involve something that they can point to as a tangible victory? And to me, that can only involve um, the basically Bashar stepping down. Uh, they, they won't settle for anything less than that. And it may be only like a moral victory, it may be meaningless if he is replaced by somebody else from within the regime uh, who has some kind of credibility you know, as an outsider to some extent. Maybe he's only a fig leaf and as you say, the regime stays in place because the regime is much more than the president and his family. Mm. Um, by the way, there's nothing left really from the family. I mean, even his sister left to Dubai now. So. Uh, yeah. His brother-in-law used to be a powerful man. He was killed probably by opposition uh, a few weeks ago. Right. So it's not really a family issue anymore. It's, uh, it's, exactly. it's the That's army. That's my mostly. point. Is that, yeah. Right. So, I mean, why can't we see a, uh, some kind of like a scuff situation in Syria? Or do you think that's likely? I mean, where we have, okay, the army just takes control, they get, Bashar is gone, the Assads are gone, the Assad era is over, and there's a new, there's a new kind of uh, transitional uh, government in place. Uh, everybody realizes it's still the old regime, it's still the old guard, but they're supposed to be there temporarily en route to dem uh, de democ uh, democratic elections that are monitored. That to me is the only thing that's going to, uh, has a chance of stopping violence. Well, as I said, uh, elections are due in 2014. I think the most uh, logical um, uh, outcome would be to allow uh, internationally monitored presidential elections for 2014, where Assad will be allowed to run. If he's such a bad guy, you would be confident he would lose. But if you are scared he will win again, then then you're wrong. He's not that unpopular. And we've seen in Egypt uh, when everybody assumed the Egyptian people yeah. hate the regime. We found out that uh, Ahmad Shafi, the regime's candidate, got the 50 percent of the votes at the end. Right. So uh, we cannot allow the opposition to dictate what future Syria would look like. And we cannot allow the regime to dictate what future Syria would look like. Ideally, we'd, we'd, we would facilitate for the supporters of both sides to, to be able to vote for everything and uh, with general understanding that uh, uh, I mean people mentioned the Turkish model uh, that we should follow the Turkish model uh, democracy in Turkey started in 1908 the first uh, constitution was uh, uh, was introduced in 1908 and until recently the army was there to protect secularism uh, minorities and secular Syrians will also need the army to remain there or the regime or the army to remain there somewhere in the background uh, to protect secularism and to protect Syria's national interest. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the meantime, if you give the, uh, the uh, people the, uh, the uh, chance to elect their government and parliament in a free way from new parties that are in introduced, uh, it's a lot of progress. I mean, nations will not become democratic overnight. We have we have to forget the Arab Spring uh, story, the Hollywood story uh, that CNN loved to report. Let's be realistic. Uh, getting 50% of democracy in two years is great, as long as we have a path for progress for the next five years or 10 years, whatever it is. Uh, I mean, yes, I mean, it's nice to be energetic, but why do we have to rush and have everything tomorrow morning? It's not going to happen. We will break it. Right. Okay, well, on that no. optimistic note, uh, I think that we, our time is up. But uh, thanks, Camille. It's been great talking as always. Same and, here. Uh, I hope that we don't have to have this conversation in a year. Uh, 
hopefully things will be better. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, yes, Mahana Brown University uh, worldwide on Vlogging Heads uh, TV with my friend Kamino Trapji. Um, good night. Good night. <laughs>